Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker and I have the privilege of an interview with a fascinating young lady, young lady, am I that old? Uh, but she has recently, and I'm saying recently, it was very recently, as recently as just a couple of days ago, disassociated and I am anxious to know what a disassociation is like in the age of coronavirus and Zoom meetings. Jana Montero, have I pronounced your name and welcome. <laughs> you, you have, much better than the brothers who were supposed to uh, announce me. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the channel. Correctly. Yeah, Thank I, you. going through, I've obviously had the pleasure of listening to the recording of your exchange with the elders, which we'll come to, it was fascinating. Um, what's it like to be free? It's, it's amazing. It's wonderful. It's, uh, I, I, I just, I hugged everybody. At, it was at, on my birthday. So uh, I actually had and a my birthday, birthday party. as well, because it was the 10th of September. So. Yes. So belated happy birthday. <laughs> the stars have aligned for this. So, right. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, um, I actually had a birthday party um, and I got to hug everybody. I was so excited. It was like a, it's just a new beginning. It was like a weight off my shoulders. I so don't you have had, to. You had friends and family uh, with you in the room when you heard it announced over the Zoom call. Yes, they, uh, some of them could not understand why it was so important that I had this uh, meeting droning on in the background during a party. <laughs> 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 While they were talking about gossip and uh, ever loyal to Jehovah and they were like, what is, what is happening right now? Well, I thought we were eating cake, you know, uh, but I was like, they're going to announce something very important to me and I have to, <laughs> I have to catch it. I mean, I have wow. my baptism on, on a DVD somewhere, so I, I definitely needed to mark that moment. Fascinating. Well, again, we do have a lot of information about uh, the circumstances surrounding your disassociation, because, again, you've kindly shared this recording of a conversation you had with your elders who were, it seems, frantically trying to salvage you to the religion. <laughs> They really, they really were. They, uh, uh, it was, it wasn't the first call either that they were trying to, to get me to come back. Um, it was over a couple of weeks that I mean, I was, were you I donating getting... a lot to the organization? I mean, <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> but anyway, we'll come to all of that. Uh, but perhaps let's back up because you have had an interesting life and I want to get to the bottom of it. So talk us through how you came to be involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so I come from one of those uh, fun things called a divided household. Um, my mom was not, I was never a Jehovah's Witness and my father is the one who was second generation in. Um, so my mom primarily raised me um, until I was about nine. Um, my nana, my father, my paternal grandmother, um, dedicated witness till the very end of her life. Uh, she talked to my mom, um, got permission to take me to a convention. And my mom was like, yeah, yeah, it's God. God's good for a kid. Go ahead. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so I went, um, I think it was during lunch, the lunch hour, she got up, was talking to some of her witness friends. I was just kind of sitting there uncomfortable in a skirt. And then this man started walking over to me and I was like, anybody? Nobody. Okay, cool. And he just continued to, to walk straight over to me because, you know, all of the alarm bells in my little child brain was bringing, ringing. And he sat down. And he was like, hi, Jana. I was like, he knows my name. He's like, I'm your dad. I was like, huh, I guess I can see that. So I met my dad at a convention. <laughs> and, As you do. Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, and then once that, once that connection started with that side of the family again at age nine, um, I think there was sort of this desperation to be accepted by them because I had been cut out of that family for so long. Um, and so I started going to the Kingdom Hall with them uh, once a week and on, uh, on Saturday, uh, I mean, not on Sunday until I was able to, you know, make that decision as a teenager. My mom allowed me to get baptized because she didn't know any better. <laughs> well, in fairness to your mother, she was, like you say, she didn't know any better. She was right. probably doing what, what was what right What she thought was her. best, of course. Yeah. yeah. Because Gosh. a little bit of God never hurt anybody, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Seems so. Uh, so how old were you when you got baptized? 17. 17. Yeah. Um, I remember you... my first book study too, because uh, I don't think I was ever really cut out for this whole cult life. Uh, <laughs> but I remember my first book study. Uh, I sat there and I think we were doing the Daniel prophecy book. It was one of the prophecy books, but we were going, we were going through a prophecy and they were talking about uh, numbers, not the book of numbers, but numbers specifically. Oh how yeah, they... Daniel is all about complicated numbers, the 23 weeks or whatever it is. And that, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so apparently the, the question was, uh, we were ta they were talking about how God chose the number seven mm. uh, to be his number a whole number or something and I raised my hand for the first time and everybody was really excited and they called me and I was like why seven I was like that's an odd number um why not an even number why why would he pick seven of all numbers and the brother just it was just silent for a second like how oh, dare she ask a question <laughs> And then after that meeting is when they started studying with me. The brother came up to me and was like, you have a lot of great questions. Here's a sister. She's going to help answer them. And that's when they started the one-on-one -on -one indoctrination sessions. I think, you know, it's the first time I've really thought about it now that you've literally just said it. But what an odd thing for the supreme celestial creator of the universe to be interested in attaching significance to numbers it's it seems rather banal doesn't it for yeah. for an intelligence <laughs> that can fashion the atom and can fashion the laws of physics to ooh, <laughs> the number seven <laughs> you know it's just, just weird isn't it um, and also to limit himself to a thing that humankind made up we made up numbers <laughs> yeah it's it's bizarre how did we not see this at the time you know um, i feel that way a lot and then i i just know they you know they're really good at what they do because they wouldn't have eight million people doing it if they weren't <laughs> based on the information that you've shared with me already am i to understand that you have some knowledge of the um, appalling way that this organization deals with victims of abuse. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I would uh, experience that firsthand. Um, it was, uh, my father was actually the, um, what do you want to call him? Who came up to you at the convention? Yes. Yeah. Who introduced himself at the convention, that same man. Um, when I was 11, I came home one night and got into bed with me. Um, and when I, when things were going well, well, so as a kid, you know, there are a lot of justifications that you make for this thing. Like, oh, well, he didn't know me when I was a baby, so maybe that's why, or, um, you know, uh, it, he was paying me special attention because he wants to know me better as a daughter somehow, 
you know, you try to make all these justifications for it. Um, but when he got reinstated, I, uh, I was so pee me. <laughs> I was so mentally in, in, uh, wrapped up in the doctrine that I was like, no, uh, he's gonna contaminate Jehovah's clean organization. This is, he's a sinner. I know this and I need to, I need to do something about it. So he, sorry, if we could just back up a little bit. So he was, you say he was, when he was reinstated, he was disfellowshipped for what happened with you, was he? No. Um, All right. no. Um, so, uh, no. So, um, I am the product of adultery. <laughs> he was married. Right. Um, to a sister, uh, who was ever faithful to him until he died. Um, and so I, when an extra extramarital affair, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so when yeah. he came back into your life at the convention, it was because he'd been reinstated, was it? Um, I don't think so. I think that's probably why my Nana walked away because he was probably still disfellowshipped. And so she probably couldn't speak to him, but because I was wondering why I was completely left alone there as ah, okay. a nine-year-old girl <laughs> in a place of hundreds of people. So and then he was strange... still disfellowshipped, you think, at the convention yes. when he came up to yeah. you? Okay. And then he, was he got reinstated, and that's when I decided I needed to tell the elders what was going on. So did the abuse begin before his reinstatement yes right yep absolutely and continued after and and how did the elders react once you approached them um well now i'm familiar with the two witness rule um so i know that they were never going to do anything <laughs> uh they kind of listened politely and uh, then they were like, well, we can get him to come in here. And I was like, I don't want to talk about it to him. Like, I'm telling you because you're going to start using him to do the microphones. You're going to start giving him assignments. And like, he should not be the one that you're letting teach the congregation. And so they sent, they sent me home. <laughs> with with this man uh, who I just told them all of these things about um, and uh, I guess they talked to him beforehand because later on I went into my room and he was sitting on my bed with the Bible and he shared with me the scripture about uh, well he asked me if I knew what the name Satan, the devil meant. Um, cause one of those names means slanderer. Um, and so he shared the scripture about slander and he also shared a scripture about, I forget which one it is, but it's about, um, I think it says something like, uh, a wise woman builds up her house, a stupid woman tears it down with her own hands, um, to imply that, I was slandering him and that I was causing dissension in the family. How, how could he say that to you one-on-one -on -one, knowing exactly what had happened? Surely he understood that slander, <laughs> slander is when you lie about something that's happened and he mm. knew that it had happened. So why was he, how, how could he have the kind of the goal to tell you that you were slandering him when he, it's the sort of thing where you could imagine him saying that in the presence of someone else because he's trying to convince the Man. third party. Yeah, no, it's, it's baffling. I, I think he, to a certain degree, enjoyed my confusion about the whole thing. And so, like, there was another time where I was talking to him where I did confront him, like, face, face to face. Okay, so... This is what happened. He was trying to use your kind of youth and naivety to 
kind of rewrite your memory, do you think? Right. Right. And to make it seem like I was the one who was creating mm. bad. Mm. Like if these things happen behind closed doors, and nobody knows about it, it's fine. Mm. So uh, to go with that, so one day um, he had fallen off the wagon again with his, you know, after he was reinstated, he fell off the wagon again with his drinking and he was, he was gone for like two whole days. And he came back just in time because we had had a dinner planned with a couple from the congregation. And so they were going to come over for dinner. And so he came home just in time to like shower and shave and get ready for this. And I was like, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like we're a normal family when you were just gone for two whole days. And we know that you were up to a whole bunch of debauchery. Absolutely not. And so he was like, you will sit at this table and you will be nice to, to the brother and sister. So I sat at the table. I wouldn't eat anything. I was not talking. The brother and sister were like, she, she okay? Are you okay? And then I was made to go to my room because I was disrupting the, the dinner. Um, what a bizarre controlling man. Um, <laughs> yeah, but he was empowered by them, hmm. you know? So dare I ask whether he was reported to the authorities? No. No, never. So as far as the authorities are, con are concerned, nothing's ever happened. There's never been no. any... There was also never, there was never a second witness because it didn't happen to any, either of my sisters. So it was just me. And then after he died, I was like, I'm literally the only other person on earth that remembers this. So maybe I am crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and how did- That's what gaslighting does. <laughs> sure. If I may ask, how did he uh, pass away? Cancer. Yeah. And it just would have been nice if you could have seen some justice in your lifetime. You know, he, he kind of got away with it, didn't he? Because of oh, yeah. the way the elders dealt yep. with it or didn't. Deal and with it. everybody in the congregation just flocked to him because he was so charismatic. He was funny. Um, he, we held book study in our house um he had uh we would have cookouts uh like you know when there was a goodie night after after the meeting other congregate other book studies would come to our goodie night because that's how good our goodie night was um You're so gonna have everybody to back up and say what a goodie night is i kind oh. of get the idea <laughs> but it's um, basically like a, a get together is it like a yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i guess it's a it's probably just an American congregation thing, but after it was like once a month after book study um, at the house, everybody would bring a dish or a dessert and you would have tea and coffee and everybody would just kind of socialize afterwards. Yeah, that sounds familiar to me, actually. Vague <laughs> memories of that sort of thing happening. Yeah. The book study arrangement, of course, was something else, wasn't it? The, the youth of yeah. today. Don't know what we're talking about but uh, yeah <laughs> um gosh that's that's incredible uh, and i'm am i also given to understand that in addition to this appalling abuse and the way it was uh, mishandled you were also discouraged when it came to higher education yes um so because i was in a i was raised by one parent who is normal, <laughs> uh, a worldly parent and one Jehovah's Witness parent. Um, I did strive to get good grades and I was still allowed to do some extracurricular activities. I did some plays, but until I was fully sort of indoctrinated saying, oh, well, I can't miss the meeting to myself. I, I had to set those boundaries because my mom wasn't going to. Right. But wasn't it your your mother who convinced you to get baptized in the first place? This is what what's confusing me. Oh no, my mom. My mom is the one who was not in 
at all. Right. So who was convincing you to get baptized? So my father's side. Right. My Nana um, oh, got yeah, baptized. Nana. Okay. Yeah, my Nana right. got baptized right. in 74. <laughs> I wonder what the motivation was. <laughs> yeah. Interesting timing, Nana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I started to get to know my dad and I wanted to fit in with his wife and kids because I was not part of that family unit. So um, then uh, Pioneer, uh, two Pioneer sisters studied with me to indoctrinate me. My mom was never, never in. And because she was never in, she obviously had a quote unquote normal attitude towards self-improvement and higher education and that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I 100% credit her with my critical thinking skills. <laughs> Um, and my willingness to ask questions. I was always asking questions and they didn't like that. Um, but yeah, so she, uh, she let me do some, you know, plays and after school stuff. And um, I ended up getting a full scholarship to a college here in North Carolina. And she really wanted me to accept it. I got baptized at 17. I had just promised my life to Jehovah. And so I think there was this DVD that came out um, before, you know, JW.org, but it was young people. What will you do with your life? Probably got it on my shelves. <laughs> Probably. Uh, hang on one moment. <laughs> You do. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> what will you do with your life? Oh, well, yeah, there we go. So this DVD proved to be influential in your education or lack of. Lack thereof, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there was a, I, I was always a writer um, in elementary school I won young authors awards I was always at my mom like entered me in competitions and things and so um that that was sort of like always my dream job then I watched this dvd uh, you know after being indoctrinated I watched this dvd and it says if you're looking for fame in satan's world what is he gonna want from you and I was like well I, don't, I guess I don't want fame in Satan's world. <laughs> I want an everlasting life. I don't, I don't want whatever he's going to give me. So I had this, I was torn um, because, I mean, not everybody gets a full ride to uh, university. And so, and, but my mom was really pushing it because um, from her perspective, she was a single parent because my father never financially contributed because he had his own family to deal with. So she was like, this is a great opportunity. So she actually made me go. And she was like, go. And when you're 18, if you decide that you need to leave, you'll be an adult and there's nothing I can do at that point. <sighs> and unfortunately I, I left. I, I got, well, I got so depressed being on the college campus where, you know, they had convinced me, jo the Jehovah's Witnesses had convinced me that it was like a hotbed of sex and drugs and <laughs> I was just going to get like mauled by Satan, especially being freshly baptized and Satan's, you know, uh, after you then. And so I had gotten so sick, depressed, that my hair started falling out. And so... Um, I was made to go to the doctors on campus and I uh, wasn't sleeping and it finally it was my birthday and I just left. I left and went to my dad's even though he was the one who had done horrible things to me. He was like, come here. This is a spiritual household. You'll be safer here with us. How did your mom feel about that? She hated every second of it. 
<laughs> Absolutely, hated every second of it. Um, she forgives me now, she understands um, to, as much as she can. Uh, and she's very supportive. She's always been very supportive. So um, I'm grateful to have my never been in family. Um, but at the time she was furious. And would it be accurate to say that you look back with regret on the decision that you made? I do, yeah, I do. Um, I, I try not to regret too much. Um, I feel like that attaches too much of a negative hold on something. Um, you were doing the best you could with the information you had. Right, and, and yeah. all I can do now is learn from it. So, Indeed. yeah, so I, I'd, I'd rather say that than, than regret, but things would have been different, certainly, um, if I hadn't literally lost my mind because of Jehovah. <laughs> that Caleb and Sophia video, where Sophia's looking out the window at the the poster of a a girl in a graduation cap and she's excited about it that broke my heart when i saw that i can imagine yeah because the next generation is receiving exactly the same pressure to conform yeah. and to and to go without um i think another area of pressure apart from the dissuading of higher education um is romantically and in terms of relationships you are very limited aren't you when mm -hmm. it comes to who you can choose as a marriage mate right um in what way did that culture of kind of repression and uh, limitation affect you so there were a lot of factors that drove me to become engaged to a ministerial servant um so one, women can only go so far by themselves in the organization. And I've always been very driven and being a pioneer was as far as I could go by myself. At that point to do Bible school or ministerial training or anything, you had to be a couple. So I needed to marry somebody. <laughs> uh, two, um, I, wanted out of my dad's house because I wasn't safe. Um, I wasn't safe and I wasn't happy. And I tried to, I tried to move out, but stay close for my sisters. I had talked to um, brothers and sisters in the congregation that I knew had extra rooms. I was working part-time, I was pioneering, you know, by, by all, by all factors, I was, you know, good standing in the congregation like i'm somebody they would have wanted in their home but i kept getting no's every everyone i asked no 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 until finally someone was like you need to stop going around asking to get out of your house if you can't submit to your father you're never going to get married because <laughs> the headship arrangement Course, yeah. uh, so um, going out pioneering, uh, there was another young, there was a young man in the congregation who was also pioneering and, um, you know, you spend a lot of time together. <laughs> um, and so we, we got engaged and um, his parents did not like me uh, because you're strong-minded. <laughs> yeah, mainly because, yeah, I wasn't fully raised in the truth. And so I was tainted a little bit by the world. Um, and so they, they never like fully accepted me. Um, but he wasn't motivated to do anything else. Right. And so, you know, I was working, I was pioneering. I was like, we can get an apartment. Let's let's get an apartment. I'll live there until you're ready to leave your father's house, and then we'll get married. And we'll and he just he wouldn't pull the stick out. Um, he was still focused on, uh, I mean, his spiritual stuff. Uh, he wanted 
he actually wanted to go to um what was that school called was it ms mts mts yes yeah. he wanted to go there but his relationship with me meant that he couldn't and so yeah. he i was should probably a... explain that okay yeah <laughs> as, as an mts graduate um, <laughs> they did actually have a rule whereby uh, you weren't allowed to go to MTS if you were in any relationships. Um, and they did actually, I think, when I went to MTS, they were in the process of distancing themselves from that rule because they realized that it effectively, it, it effectively amounted to celibacy, which is a Catholic tradition. Um, yeah. But yeah, the rules were that you, you weren't to be in a relationship. And uh, I can tell you all sorts of stories about how lads were getting Pillow around gate. those rules. <laughs> oh, no, no, it didn't involve laundry or bed linen or anything. Um, no, there were just lads on my in my class, who one of whom actually had a girlfriend. He was just mm. keeping it secret, you know. Double um, life. <laughs> and another, <laughs> another lad who was in our car party to go to the class every day, he actually started a relationship with the family he was staying with while they were on the tour. <laughs> Oh, good grief. Randy MTS Brothers, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, but yes, that was the rule. So am I t right in saying that he broke off the courtship because he wanted to go to MTS? Is that what you're saying? No. All right. Okay. Just the opposite. He made such a big deal that he was giving up this spiritual opportunity for me that I should be grateful to him. Well, how noble it. of him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um. So it got to the point where I couldn't live there anymore. And so I was like, well, I have to go back to my mom. I, I can't be here anymore. I can't support myself on the salary that I'm making. I, I have to go back to my mom. Mm. My mom, worldly, again, uh, had married a woman or has been in a relationship with a woman. And so... He was like, you can't go back there. That's like G Sodom and Gomorrah. You'd be, Jehovah's Spirit wouldn't be able to get to you in that house because it would be blocked because of all the, the willful sin that's happening. But I wasn't safe. He knew I wasn't safe where I was, but he was making no effort to, I told him what was happening. You know, he was my fiance. And I told him, okay, I, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to, and so I did, I prayed about it and prayed about it. And then we came together and I said, I prayed on it. And I still think that going back is the right thing for me to do. And he was, he said, are you sure you didn't pray biasly? And that's when I was like, okay, I, this is, this is enough. I mean, there was, there was so much more to that where it was very emotional man, manipulative. Um, but at the moment where you're questioning the quality of my prayer is sort of like, okay, you're not the only one who, who gets to talk to God and get answers, sir. <laughs> Another reason why I was never going to do well. <laughs> in cold life but. so he knew he knew about the situation with your father and he was pals with him until he, he got his fellowship friends okay he was friends with your father despite mm -hmm. knowing what your father had done yes I still thought you were better off with your father than uh, it, then a lesbian mom it sounds like in addition <laughs> to being incredibly controlling he was an idiot um yeah. That's fair to say. <laughs> Gosh. So w did you break it off, I'm, I'm assuming, I at did. that point? yeah. Okay. I did. Um, and did things improve when you moved in with your mother? Um, well, yeah, for me, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, but it, it's not when I started waking up. So I was still, mm. I was still sort of entrenched in the... The religion and I was still going to meetings and beating myself up for not being able to pioneer anymore and you know why wasn't I happy with a ministerial servant now I'm single and 
uh, it was it, it was a journey. <laughs> am, am I right in saying as well? I don't know where this happened in your story, but you mentioned that you lost a family member due to the blood doctrine. Are you able to tell us about that? Partly, um, Partly. due to yeah. So it did come into play um, during. So it was actually my paternal grandmother the one who, like I said, she was a faithful witness until she died. Um, she was a beautiful woman and she just had terrible sons. I don't, I don't know. Um, but she was the one who'd pressured brought you me to, to the convention. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She, you know, I don't know. She was, she was a great human. She just was misled. Mm. Um, she thought she was doing the right thing for God. We all did <laughs> at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so she um, came down with lung disease. This, the actual issue was lung disease. Um, then they did the test to see if she would qualify for a transplant, but she was not okay with taking a transplant because of the blood issue because it doesn't say anything about organs necessarily. And she was like, I don't want to take the chance. What if there's blood in the lungs or what if this or what if, DNA, there's no DNA mentioned in the Bible and blood is the life force. And if I end up with this, then, so she didn't want to be put on the donor list. The doctor said, okay, well, if you don't get a donation, if you don't get lungs, your lungs are irreversibly damaged. You're going to die. She was like, okay, I'm going to die. And she cried to me in the hospital saying, you know, I never thought I would die in the system. I thought I was going to be one of the few who would never taste death. And she held my hand and said, you know, I, I want to see you there. I have to see you there. And I lied to her because I, I was already having doubts and I said, you Oh, know, you would though, wouldn't you? When they're on yeah. the deathbed, it's the least you can do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I lied to her. I was like, it's still the plan, Anna. It's still, I still plan on it. Mm. But I didn't um, because I don't believe it. And I didn't believe it then. But she, um, she ended up getting this blood clot that was putting pressure on her heart and uh, the doctors came in and the doctors were like, okay, well, we can break it up. The problem is the procedure, when we break it up, um, there's a 3% chance that it could cause internal bleeding. Because you won't take blood, there will be nothing that we can do for you. And she didn't want to take the risk. I'm confused. So <laughs> the three percent was if it goes wrong. If it goes wrong. You'd still surely roll the dice if that's the only option. <gasps> that's what I thought. I said, Nana, it's three percent. That's ninety what, ninety seven percent chance that you're gonna be okay. Yeah. And she was like and she said, uh this whole bleeding internally thing, they they ex I, they explained it in pretty gruesome how it how it would feel to bleed internally. And so it scared her and she was scared. She, she was like, I don't want to take that chance. This is very interesting, I think, because here's what I think is a bit of a misconception among not just kind of outsiders, but also some XJWs. This idea that if you're allowed to do something, if there's a loophole, you're going to take it. Uh, and I think there's this misconception when it comes to blood fractions. Um, so in other words, because you're, because it's now a conscience matter or has been a conscience matter since 2000, that you're allowed to take certain blood products, therefore people are going to accept them. I don't buy into that. I personally, when they did that rule change in 2000, I was one of those in the congregation who was saying I would still refuse them because where's the blood coming from? You know, right. someone has to donate that blood for there to be blood products that I can accept. 
-hmm. you're telling me we're going to be having this arrangement in the new system are we um so i was one of those who would have refused blood, blood fractions on principle because i wanted to if, if there was any doubt over my place in paradise i would rather err on the side of caution and it sounds as though your grandmother was exactly the same mentality of i'm going to err on the side of caution if there's any possibility whatsoever that i could even be brought into a situation where my faith will be tested i'm going to avoid it completely 100%. so I, th I think that your nana's experience and well trad the, the tragic loss of your nana highlights that fact that some witnesses will err on the side of caution because they want that place in paradise. And I kept telling her, because same thing, she she was saying that, you know, she, she wants to be in paradise. And I was like, Nana, if you don't make it, none of, none of us have a chance. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. She she just didn't want to jeopardize her her possibility. Well, that's, so, that's yeah. dreadful. And uh, my condolences. Um, Thank you. So it was a year on the seventh. It sounds as though you've had, it, it's been a, a remarkable story and we still don't know exactly how you managed to wake up. So <laughs> unless there's something else we're missing out, um, <laughs> I'm anxious to know what brought you to that point. Um, I did want to go back. I, I sure. wanted to say something. Please do. About <laughs> my dad. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we talked we talked about the abuse. It started mm -hmm. at started at 11, 12 and it continued after that and then like it was it was like coming into my room when we were when it was after a meeting and I was just in a slip and a bra and just I was like it's okay. I'm your dad. It's like no, get out of my room. I'm, I'm changing. This is not okay. Um but so yeah, he ended up getting disfellowshipped over uh, his alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the elders, he disfellowshipped again. So it's not that the elders didn't believe my story. It was just, there was literally nothing that they were going to do about it. So they thought that his alcoholism was a more pressing problem than for his the abuse congregation. Of you. Yes, because I'm the only one who knew about it. So, um, so when it started being sort of noticed, I suppose, at book study or those goodie nights that I mentioned. Um, they would come to me after the meeting at, at the Kingdom Hall and be like, what's, go what's going on? Because they knew that I was the truth teller. They knew that I was the whistleblower on the family. <laughs> so, Even though they were very selective over which whistles over they would listen to. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, so he did end up getting this fellowship, but it was for um, it was for his alcohol, and he was reinstated like right before he died. So. And here's an interesting question: What other witnesses were there to his alcoholism other than you? Oh, uh, brothers and sisters at functions. Because yeah. I'm just thinking, if it was that obvious, why did they need you for information? Why couldn't yeah. they piece it together themselves? It's just it, the the priorities are just completely back to front, aren't they? Um, and we see this as well in other areas with the child abuse policy, because I'm hoping, by the way, that your elders are watching this. Uh, <laughs> you have this bizarre thing in the Shepherd book where, oh, if someone's uh, interrupting the meeting, call the police. If someone's damaging Kingdom Hall property, call the police. If someone is accused of molesting a child, oh, uh, call the branch office. You know, the, the hypocrisy <laughs> and the different standards is just ridiculous. And the, the lack of understanding the urgency of the situation really shines through there. They, they cared more about his alcohol consumption. I wish people would care about Tony Morris's alcohol consumption, by the way, in the same way. <laughs> um, but they cared more about that than yeah. a child being in danger or children being in danger. Um, dreadful. Yeah, but it did stop from 
having any sort of access to other children because book studies stopped being held at our house. Um, so families weren't coming over and we weren't able to have the goodie nights anymore. So, you know, it stopped. They found another way to do it, I suppose, if that's what they were trying to do. But more than likely, it had nothing to do with what I told them. Um, so, uh, not sorry, I'm really just taking your time. But <laughs> uh, not at all. I'm enjoying it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one time, these sisters were coming from out of town, and they needed a place to stay. And my family was like, this was before my dad was uh, disfellowshipped again. They were like, yeah, 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 come stay with us. Um, and then this couple was, a, a couple was already staying with us because their lease was up and they were looking for a new place. So it was a, um, a couple from the congregation who uh, they were, you know, studying a foreign language and they were very spiritual and it was good to have them in the house to influence us girls. So once they said yes to these traveling sisters, the house was tiny, right? So there were two bedroom there were two bedrooms for us girls and me and my sister shared one and then the baby had her own and then a uh, parents bedroom. So then the two sisters are here. So they're going to get uh, a blow up mattress sort of in the living room area. Right. And then the couple are staying in mine and my sister's room. And the only room that was left was baby sister's room for us girls. Baby sister had bunk beds, but it was the same bunk beds that the whole thing started in with my dad. Mm. And so I absolutely was not going to sleep in there. And I said, no, not going to do it. Absolutely not. And everybody pretended like, why, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because you have a perfectly good bed in there. What is wrong with you? I will not sleep. I'm not sleeping in that room. I will not sleep in that room. And I just ended up looking stubborn and ungrateful in front of these traveling sisters and this couple because I was throwing fit over having to stay in the room with my sisters and I just got so frustrated I went in my room which was now being occupied by the couple I went in my room and I closed the door um and the wife of the couple was in there but there was literally nowhere else to escape to and I just started crying because I couldn't I couldn't handle it I I felt trapped and I was just, I just started crying and she came over and she hugged me and she said, you don't have to tell me, but hopefully one day you'll tell me. So I got to know her a little better. And then one day I did tell her the truth apart from, you know, apart from the elders, I hadn't really talked too much about what was going on to like brothers and sisters, you know, but <clears throat> so I did tell her and unfortunately it happened to her, but what happened to her was an elder in her congregation. That's, that's, that's how rampant it is. That's how much they're. Yeah, because I, I was listening to that, not knowing any of this, by the way, this is the first time I'm hearing it. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, that, that lady had really good intuition. Uh, she did. And, and the reason why she had good intuitions, because she, there was a connection there. She was a fellow victim. That's, that's. Yeah. Oh, it it and... deals with this abuse issue where it, the more I learn about how commonplace it is, the more I'm astounded that I never in my years as a witness happened to encounter it. Of course, the reason why I didn't encounter it is because out of my 23 years, I think from being baptized to disassociating, I was only an elder for one of those years. So how was mm -hmm. I going to know? Um, right. But yeah, it, it's just incredible how, 
how commonplace the abuse is, you know. It's sad. Well, it isn't incredible. It's perfectly understandable once you know what all the policies are and all of the various loopholes that these individuals can exploit. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, really drives home. Thank you for sharing that story. So waking up part. Yeah. <laughs> Fast forward. Um, so it's going to sound silly, but um, apart from all of the things that made me not fit for that life, uh, asking too many questions, being a woman with ambition. <laughs> Having a um, mind of your own. Right. Yeah. No, apart from all of those things, um, I was watching a show on Facebook Facebook watch of all things, making me question what television even is nowadays. Like, what is this? Um, but I was watching a show on Facebook and it was about a, a girl who escaped from a cult. And the psychologist used the term love bomb and explained what love bombing is. And I was like, wait, we do that. I was like, I remember that's exactly how I felt at the first time I went to the Kingdom Hall. Everybody hugs me and it was creepy as heck because I didn't know anyone and they were still just that excited to see me, but I was intrigued at the same time because why were they so happy? I wanted to be that happy. Um, and so I heard that term, I was like, Okay, I, I was still afraid of Google <laughs> because they built up this fear that, you know, the scary apostates are out there to get you. And if you Google something, then they're going to influence you and then Satan's going to be in your brain, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I'm making it sound ridiculous because no, that's the is. paranoia, isn't it? I mean, in yeah. my own. In my own situation, I think I write in my book, it was like, okay, now lightning is going to come out of the sky and render me a burnt crisp because I'm going on apostate websites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was still afraid, but I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to prove to myself that it's not a cult hmm. by looking up this information. So I Googled Jehovah's Witnesses, cults, and I started doing research and I was like, I don't know that this is a credible source. This kind of looks Catholic. <laughs> this might, this might, this might not be. And this a is... picture of a Pope on the website or right. something. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was some university that had Catholic in the title. And I was yeah. like, no, 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 they're biased. They're, they're mm. uh, part of Babylon the Great. So, <laughs> um, so I was dismissing a lot of stuff until I came across, um, Steve Hassan, yeah, Stephen Hassan, mm -hmm. this book, Combating Cult Mind Control. Sure. Um, and I listened Which to Which I'm in, thing. I think. I think I'm in, my story's no in way. there somewhere. Yeah, the latest version. Oh, I, I probably don't have the latest version. <laughs> um, but I listened to the audio book and um, listened to his experience with the Moonies and it was just like, this, this is real. This really is a cult. And I didn't actually say the words out loud until I remember the day. It was January 1st, 2019. <laughs> was the first, the first time I put, I said out loud to someone that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. I was in a cult. This is actually interesting. Which edition did you read because he oh. he do you have it on your shelf can I have a look ah yes you see that is the first version which mm -hmm. if I'm right in saying doesn't mention Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> once there he is so it doesn't mention Jehovah's Witnesses once in that version does it which is non-threatening which is non-threatening, but in the newer version, um, he, he actually, he, well, I, I said he mentions my story, but 
um, in the intervening years, he'd obviously had Jehovah's ex Jehovah's Witnesses reaching out to him and saying, you know, what you've written about your experience in the Moonies applies mm -hmm. equally to. So that's interesting. So the fact that you were reading the first version, which doesn't mention Jehovah's Witnesses, you, do you feel that helped in some way? Absolutely. Right. Because I didn't feel that it was biased against me. It was, mm. I was just taking in knowledge about what a cult is and these tactics that psychologists use and how the brain works. And I was like, this, this makes sense. And mm. they're not attacking Jehovah. Mm. And so it, it didn't feel threatening, like a scary apostate like you. <laughs> I have been known to be quite scary, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so then after I read that, um, I did listen to your book. Um, I don't have your book. I did listen to your book, um, the escaping the watchtower. Mm. And, um, so, well, in between there, right. I was watching the videos. Um, I was drawn to yours because you didn't seem angry. Like I thought an apostate would be. <laughs> thought an apostate Edit all those bits out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought an apostate would be an, an angry, just hateful person. Mm. And it was, just, I edit out the parts where I'm smashing a glass on the floor and all that. Yeah. Kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking your cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So then I started watching the videos and um, I, I got real, I got real angry because I felt like, uh, I felt like I was, I was lied to. I was robbed of time. I was robbed of, uh, family, my family. And then I saw it was like right around the time when, uh, bottle gate happened mm. and that infuriated me. You released that video and I was like, my family struggled to make rent and also contributed to the, I was privileged once to sit by a donation box at an assembly. Oh, how, how grateful I should like, and, and this is what you're doing. Yeah. The human, human security system at a, at a convention, some, yeah. some person stood next to a cardboard box, making sure no one nicks it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> that was this dummy. <laughs> wow. Um, but I was, that made me angrier because, and then I had the same question that your caller had. Well, what's in it for them? You know, mm. it's not like, you know, it's not like they're getting, but now, no, they are getting a lot out of them. <laughs> it's the power. Well, they're getting enough it's, for, yeah. for, for to them to be living comfortably enough for him yeah. to splash that amount of money on, on booze. Yeah. Um, and so it started with the book, it started with YouTube and then, um, and then there was the anger portion. I was angry and I decided that I wanted to make videos and tell my story. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if I like documented it while I'm going through it. And I absolutely did not do that at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I got prepared for it. I was like, I, I started a whole uh, new, which I think you mentioned in your book, starting different, um, having different names online. So I had a different oh, pseudonym. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a different name online. So no, nobody could look up my search history or see who I was friends with or, or this or that. So I had a, a fake name and all of this. And um, I'm going to show you this thing. Don't be scared. So the fake name that I had on YouTube was called uh, a black sheep. I never made any videos as a black sheep. Um, but the idea was, uh, since I was pee me, I was, uh, no, well, no, I was physically and mentally out pee So, um, I was going to hide my face since I was fading. I didn't want my family to know I, I was going to disguise my voice. Um, and I was going to wear this mask. I'm going to show it to you. It literally is a, yeah, a gouged out, <laughs> a gouged out actual sheep's head. 
Yeah. <laughs> the brain's removed. Yeah. <laughs> Would have made for a very interesting video, I must say. I, I want to watch that video. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not going to ask you to wear that for the remainder of the interview. Although. <laughs> but you're tempted, I know. <laughs> I'm tempted, yeah. Um, Pushing YouTube to new boundaries here on the John Cedars <laughs> channel. Uh, so then wow. I, I didn't do that. I didn't do any of that. Um, I just, I sat down and I went through an existential crisis. And, you know, if everything that I was told is a lie, then what's true? And I had to figure it out. And so it was, it was very dark and very scary for a while there, but I, um, I had to find out what was true for me. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wrote down was how arrogant it is to think that you could have all the answers to the universe because that's what they tell you. They tell you all the answers, they're right here in the silver sword. You got them all. It's no. Yeah, and the things that we don't have the answers for aren't worth knowing. Yeah, no, or they'll be revealed eventually in new light. You don't need to know them now. If you've thought don't. of a question that we don't have the answer to, <laughs> then you're being presumptuous if you're demanding the answer now. It's not the right time, yeah. Right. Your tiny human brain couldn't handle it. But let, us, but, let, but let us tell you all about the significance <laughs> of number seven and what that means. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it sounds like, you, you know, you, you were putting the jigsaw pieces together. Um, mm -hmm. You were even kind of contemplating doing activism, which, I, by the way, I hope you do do at some point, or I suppose you're doing that now, really. Um, does, how does that connect with the disassociation? Are we, are we at that point yet? Yeah, so um, so it was initially fading. Your, your book encouraged fading. Mm. And I'm glad that I did read the escaping the... I know you weren't looking for a promotion, but... <laughs> no, no, no. I, look, I'm going to grab any opportunity for a shameless plug. Do it. <laughs> I spent too long writing this damn thing. <laughs> Might as well plug it now and then. So we're yeah. talking about this book, viewers, How to Escape from Jehovah's Witnesses by Lloyd Evans, forward by Paul Grundy, author of JWFacts.com, available on Amazon. And so, Audible. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's there is an Audible version. And Kindle. <laughs> and Kindle. <laughs> I, think we've, I think we've plugged the hell out of that. So. <laughs> Don't forget the reluctant uh, witness as well. Uh, the reluctant <laughs> mafia. Indeed. But anyway, so, so yeah, you, so, you read this book available on Amazon.com. Go on. I did. Um, and I'm so, I'm so grateful that I did because I was filled with this rage and sort of energy. And I just, I wanted to do something and I, I didn't know what I needed to do. And so I read it and it was like, listen, We've, we've all been lied to. I've been there. I know how angry you are. And I was like, okay. And it had clear steps that sort of helped me break down what I, what I was comfortable with for my breaking away. Because, you know, I do, my sisters are baptized. Um, my father did die. My, uh, my grandmother did die. But I do have cousins and uncles and a grandfather that are still in and I have you know friends that are pioneers um and it's like I'm not being shunned as of yet they don't know that I'm having doubts um but I was able to pace my disassociation so it started do it at as your a, speed basically exactly yeah. do it at a speed where I was mentally healing um, and building myself up um, before I cut myself off too soon. Um, with at the, and then it got to the point where I was like, okay, this is toxicity and I'm done with it and I'm ready. But I, I um, right before, that week before actually, um, I wrote my letter 
I had it ready and waiting in an envelope. Um, I made phone calls to the people that I loved the most that I knew would more than likely stop talking to me and since they, they have ignored any sort of communication, which is fine because I anticipated it. Um, but I made those final calls. I said, you know, I, I love you and nothing changes on my end. And if you ever need me, I'm here for you. Mm. Um, and I, we reminisced, talked about good times. And then I told them that I was planning on sending my letter and they were all heartbroken. Um, the pioneer who studied with me, uh, she was, we, we had a good laugh. Um, at first, uh, we were talking about, uh, she I'd was be like, surprised oh. if she was laughing afterwards. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we had a good laugh at first. I started off talking about, you know, she told us that, uh, a little girl got baptized. She was 13, she got baptized, uh, What's in, the worst that could happen? In the virtual convention. So, oh, right. Okay. So yeah, for the Always so, Rejoice convention. Yeah. Yeah. So she got baptized in a In a bathtub or something like that. Oh, in a pool. Okay. Yeah. In a pool by her dad. So I was like, oh, that's special. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, she looks like you. She reminds us of you. And I was like, is she as much trouble as I was? And they're like, no. <laughs> and they were like, have you been watching the videos? You remind us of Jade. <laughs> Gosh. Right. Harsh, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um, Actually, but, that's a compliment, isn't it? Because the whole it, point yeah. is that Jade was a strong-minded woman who was making progress in life and yeah. doing self-improvement. eventually and they broke her down. It was just basically their fantasy of, we're even going to get someone like that to yeah. become a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to, you know, I told them and they were like, well, are you happy with your decision? And I said, I'm actually very happy. I'm the happiest that I've been in a, in a long time. And they're like, well, get all the happiness that you can. Thanks. I will. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Plan on it actually. <laughs> so far it's actually coming in abundance now. Like, but isn't it good though? I'm I'm really glad that you took that advice to heart. Obviously, I can write it, but that people actually um, implementing that advice it. and benefiting yeah. from it is something completely different. And it sounds as though you really did implement the advice and you were thus able to do things at your own pace and at a pace where you felt comfortable so that when the time came, you were in emotionally at the place where you could be strong and, you know, yeah. and positive about it. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, I really, really appreciated the information and being able to do it at my pace. And so then I sent in the letter. Um, my boyfriend took a picture of me putting it in the mailbox. <laughs> Recorded the whole thing. Freedom Day, <laughs> August 2nd. We're going to be celebrating that every August 2nd, Freedom Day. Absolutely. Why not? Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, it that's a... Uh, it's a new holiday. <laughs> speaking, speaking of your boyfriend, uh, the sexy voice off camera. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> he appeared to be wandering around in the background while you were being speaking to your elders. I'm assuming it was him. Oh, yes. He was. Oh, uh, he was holding back. <laughs> um, he was infuriated with how they were. Uh, I, but you understand me. where my mind's going. If the elders had known that he, that I was living with a worldly man, <laughs> exactly, the conversation would have taken a very different turn, wouldn't it? I really want to jump in there and be like, "Why are you talking to her? She disassociated. Leave. Hang up. Just no, mm. no. Especially making her say like, oh, well, you choose death. What? What kind of mess is this?' But regardless, out of respect, I had to hold my tongue a lot. Yeah, but he's been very, very supportive of me doing it at my pace because it's, you know, it's, it's hard for somebody who's not been in a high control group to understand necessarily how far the tendrils go in. Um, but it's a, it's a process and rather I have to do it my way. Rather than teasing the viewers any longer, if it's okay with you, I will play a few clips of said recording. 
Absolutely. I'm sorry. Could you repeat yourself? You were a little muffled. Can you hear me now? Yeah, a little better. Okay. Now I yeah. could I could jump in if she can hear me better. So I can hear you Janet, crystal clear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So so it's more a question of we we wanted to make sure when we get a letter like this we want to make sure that there's nothing else we can do for you. Is there something that you're concerned with? Uh, is it just that you no longer want to attend meetings or do you really not want to be associated anymore? We just wanted to get a little bit of background because we certainly care for you. And, you know, we would be very sad to hear that you wanted to disassociate. So we just wanted to reach out to you and encourage you and see if there's anything that you would share with us or any help we could offer. You know, I I know you from when I was a teenager and, you know, you, uh, yep. you're a great brother and I appreciate all of your, your kindness. Um, but, no, uh, it's mainly I just I don't believe uh, that the governing body has... God's backing anymore and I don't think that the if I don't trust the source then I can't trust the information sure is, is there any particular reason you now feel that way huh? is there anything that made that happen or well I mean it was a watchtower really and then with the new light that came about the locusts and it was just because after the Watchtower article about who is the faithful and discreet slave and how they talked about how they're, you know, not inspired and not infallible, it just kind of made me think, well, if they're just using Holy Spirit like everybody else, then why is it them? You know, there are a bunch of anointed people still alive, so why is it those seven anointed people who are distributing everything uh, and not I mean why is sure. it them if if Holy Spirit is for everybody then why do they why is it those guys well and remember in that article it talks about the faithful slave while they're while you're correct while there's the governing body and that number changes right there was just uh, one brother brother uh, uh, there was a recent brother appointed, right? I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his, the latest brother. Yeah, correct. Uh, but when those brothers are feeding the sheep, they're feeding themselves as well. So it's not like they're a, a separate class, right? And you go back to the parable, right? Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 with five fish and three loaves, right? He did it through a few. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, so it's not necessary. All of the, you know, like a, an 80-year-old anointed sister, yeah, that was the example in the article, she's not the one that's providing spiritual food to the, to the rest of the organization. It doesn't mean that she's not going to have her hope and, and be in heaven and serve as a, one of Christ's brothers and sisters, right? So, but why? So, sorry? But why? But why what? Well, why not? If she's anointed just like they are. Well, if she's going to rule I'm, in heaven as king, in, in, uh, then the same as they are, then why not now, too? It doesn't make sense. Well, no, she's not the channel. She's not the channel for the food. How would you realistically have 8,000 people all providing a single channel and producing the spiritual food that we meet with every week? Do you think that would be feasible? Well, that doesn't make any sense. So, so like, what, do they vote? They just they took a vote and they decided that these were the people and, and not that sister? No. No, I mean, it's, it's Holy Spirit, uh, for, for sure, that, that they decide who is the, the faithful slave. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I really, I'm really struggling with why that's bothering you, but it is. Yeah, it's just because if that's where the source of the food is coming from and I don't trust the source, then I can't trust the food. Just like if you know a restaurant has a a rating, then you and you're like, "Well, I don't know that I I trust the food that comes from that restaurant anymore." So do you believe in the Bible? No. 
Not anymore. Is, is there a reason? Is, 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 has anyone told you or talked to you on the phone that made you doubt the Bible? Who would have? It, you know, is there is there anyone? You know, we have, as you know, Jana, we'll refer to people. There's there's apostates that have turned against Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's always baffled me because, you know, if you want to leave the organization, there's no one that's going to stop you. We'll respect your wishes, right? And and if you ever want to come back, we're going to welcome you back. So that's not the concern. But, you know, you see people that become apost- we call apostates, and mm-hmm. they dedicate their life to just hating Jehovah's Witnesses. And I've always baffled me because if you see a Catholic that no longer is a Catholic, they just leave. <laughs> Right, and they're done with the Catholic Church. There's a group of people out there. There's all kinds of apostate websites that can lure people that are Jehovah's Witnesses and lure them away. And I was asking if there's ever been any influence that that has uh, that you've been influenced by. No, I just um, I just just stopped making sense. I, I think about when when Peter said to Jesus. You know, remember when he said to him, when people were saying that Jesus' words were shocking and who can listen to him, and they stopped following Jesus. And Peter, he said to Peter, do you want to stop following me? And Jesus, uh, when, he, when Jesus said that to him, Peter said, who do I go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life. So my question to you would be, what do you think is the reason we're all here? What do you think the future holds? I mean, do you have your own beliefs at this point? At this point, I i mean, it was a really tough time when, you know, I started feeling that way. And, yeah, at this point, sure. I do have my own belief in what that is because, you know, it felt really dark for everything that, you know, I thought I, thought I had all the answers. I thought I knew the truth about existence and why we're here and what the point of life is and where we go when we die and all that. And so, it, it yeah, it took a lot to come up to figure out what I what I really believe to be true. And, and, and what do you believe to be true? Uh, I believe that energy never dies. Scientifically, that's a fact. And so the best we can do as humans is create as much good energy as possible. So what happens when we die? We've created positive energy and it's there. And, and what does it do? What do you think that energy does? Um, I think people can use it for good or maybe, I don't know, it's it's just out there in the universe for, for access. I don't know that it necessarily maintains consciousness or anything, but um, I, I do think that, you know, it has that positive charge just like a proton or a neutron or an electron, you know. You know, I stand back at a high level, Jana, and, and I've had this thought, my discussion with myself. I look at everything that goes into designing the universe and the earth and humans, everything that happened. I struggle with why Jehovah God would have done that. To just have people live what I will tell you is a miserable life for most people, because <laughs> right? it really is. There's very, very few parts of your life that are truly great. Those people work. They struggle in this world, and they die. And, and I stand back and say, why would Jehovah go to all that trouble, or a higher source, as you said, to just have that happen? Does that make sense to you? Well, if I if I still believed in the Bible, I would say, well, why, you know, I remember the the contract that he sort of made after the Garden of Eden with Satan saying, uh you know, challenging him, and he was like, okay, well, you need this amount of time to let humans figure out that they can't rule themselves. Correct. Wouldn't you say that the time has far exceeded that? (laughs) Like, what in the world? (laughs) How many people have to die for God to step in? Uh, I, I, look, every one of us wishes this system was over, so there's no debate, Right. But you remember, the Bible talks about people that ridicule and say, well, when is this day coming? 
And, and the Bible says it's panting on, it's coming, it's going to come. So I tell you what, no matter what we all believe, I, I will tell you that, that the day will come when this system will end. There is no doubt in my mind. I I just, I don't want to waste too much more of you guys' time, but I do appreciate you calling me. We understand, Dana. Uh, is, is there is there anything that we could do to help you? Uh, is it something that you'd like to perhaps have somebody, would you like to go over some things again in more detail? Because we just hate to see you leave. I know. I'm, I'm, but I'm happy with my decision, so... Uh, I don't, yeah, no, I don't need any, any help. Okay. So at this point, you're convinced that you want to be disassociated? Yes. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're sorry to hear that, Jana, and you, you know how to reach me, right? I do, yes. Okay. So I want to leave that open to you. You reach out at any point. Because um, we would love to hear from you again, and we're uh, we're going to miss you. Thank you. I I hope you guys have a happy happy life. Yeah, thank you, Jana. Okay, brothers, thank you. So, uh, quite an astonishing conversation, and I think you dealt with it brilliantly. Um, thank you. Was there anything that you would do again? It must have been a little bit. Because you were basically telling them kind of what they wanted to hear in parts, weren't you? Uh, for mm -hmm. example, when they asked you about, have you uh, been in touch with any, have you ac accessed any apostate information? That was interesting, by the way, that they were keen on finding out about that. It was you the told, second time somebody hadn't. asked me, who put this idea in your head? Mm, as though you couldn't come up with the idea yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> As if my, my little lady brain couldn't couldn't think of it on my own. So when they asked me that, I was like, who who could have? Who would I have spoken to? Yeah, so I, I mean most of it I was I was being a bit cheeky, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um uh there is one part where they were asking me about I forget what they were asking me about, but I remember I brought up um all the years of suffering that we had to go through. That was um, a good point, actually, yeah. But what I didn't get to say is when God created this uh, deluge that destroyed all the bad people, why didn't we just start over then? Why, why, can all of the sin was gone. That's a good point because <laughs> the, whole, the whole idea of the master plan to... Uh, rid the earth of suffering was supposed to have been conceived in Eden when God said I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her and seed her and that's seed. supposed to be when God came up with that the entire plan and, and then the flood comes along actually I'm slightly <laughs> modifying the plan um, <laughs> I'm gonna wipe out all mankind apart from this one family and millions of animals that are all crammed into a wooden box um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so apart from that is there anything else because the elders might be watching you, you never know um is there anything else that you would have said in that conversation no i i didn't have any i mean there's only one of them that i remembered from uh the king hall i don't think i i would have said anything else and i haven't listened to it since it happened so my adrenaline could have been just like I, I honestly remember almost nothing from what mm. happened. Okay. So right now I'm going to say no. <laughs> I've listened to it more recently than you have. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and here as well, viewers, is Jana's announcement of disassociation. Is that uh, Jana Monteria, Monter Monterio is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, in addition to this, though, uh, we have other announcements. Uh, so tell us again what that was like. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing moment. I, I felt just like the music video, my joy is being free. I was officially, I took away their power mm. is what it was. I wrote the letter. I decided 
I didn't have to live in any kind of fear of somebody finding me or somebody seeing me out or, you know, somebody telling an elder on me or, and then getting a, a call or mm. a letter or something. I'm done with that. I took away the power. The power is mine and I'm going to use it to be happy. Fantastic. And so that announcement, it was, it was like, so when I was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, there was a moment when I was wiping the chlorine water off of me that several other people had been in before me. <laughs> I was Lovely. wiping, yeah, yeah, gross. I was wiping the chlorine off and I was like, this is Jehovah's. I've given this to him. This is his tool. And I'm not a tool anymore. <laughs> I'm mine. I bought myself back, basically. Well, I'm full of admiration. Um, obviously, what you've done is being done by others, um, but it's not being done at a rate that I would like. I, I, I'd like to see far more people put themselves through what you've put yourself through. Uh, the, it's you scary. Know, the, the discomfort of challenging your beliefs and taking affirmative action to deal with it, um, especially given everything that you've been through um, and the hardships and everything, the fact that you've come through and, and you're clearly such a balanced, well-rounded uh, individual at the end of all this, your anger appears to be in check. Uh, you seem to therapy. be in a good, a good place. Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, even taking therapy, that's a decision yeah, no, you need to make. Do you, it. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not not everyone has the courage to pursue therapy, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it all takes being strong and having courage. And uh, there's a lot of strength in you, Jana, and I, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, is there any advice you would have for any witnesses who might be watching, perhaps people who are on the fence, maybe they're in the same position you were in when you first ventured onto the internet? What would be your advice? You don't mind if I cut in real quick? My apologies. But yeah, just be strong. Um, make sure you have a good support system, you know, and, and people who are around you that can support you in this decision because it's it's hard, really hard. And I mean, I see that firsthand, but and I'm so proud of Jana so much, you know, that she's gone on through this. And all I can do is, you know, just cheer from the sidelines. Even in this interview, I don't want to show my face because, you know, I ain't trying to ruin this beautiful angle I, I got of her. So, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of courage and, um, and support. And I know you have a discord, you know, that Jana goes to. So I, go, go, go for that. Hashtag cheeky plug again. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Uh, I did sort of have a little... Uh, well, I don't know what it was where I was kind of feeling like uh, when after I had the talk with the sister who studied with me she was like well if they can be wrong couldn't you be wrong and I was like yeah of course I can you're be not wrong. claiming to be I'm God's channel of communication <laughs> with <laughs> with billions of human beings <laughs> <laughs> right but then after that conversation i was like what if what if i'm wrong <laughs> and he was like go to your discord it's okay right. talk to sure. talk to people who know what's happening i probably um, should mention that the discord is for patrons um oh, but yeah. you can be a patron from yes. like one dollar is it one dollar 25 is the minimum or I something like that but it, that's that's it's for patrons. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry yeah. I don't yet have one that's just for everybody. Uh, yeah. But if if you're looking for a community that's for everybody and you don't have to pay anything, probably Reddit, uh, mm -hmm. the the XJW subreddit is for you. But yeah, I do try to reward my patrons as much as possible, and one way I do that is by having a Discord. So yeah. <laughs> um. So if I don't know, yeah. Uh, Again, sorry, I just, I keep plugging you. I, I, he didn't ask me to do this. 
honestly haven't. I'm really sorry. I... <laughs> Lloyd did not ask me to do this at all. Um, uh, but I guess advice, um, be patient with yourself, be forgiving, because there were a lot of times where I was like, I'm smart. How did I fall for this? Why, why can't I figure this out? What, what's kept me so long, you know, in this, it's circular thinking. Um, they, they train me that way, thought blocking techniques and, um, just, it's not your fault. It's not your fault that they sucked you in. It's not your fault that you, and also it's okay. I mean, not all of those people are bad people. You met a lot of great people. A lot of those hugs were real, mm. but they are, they can't hug you now, but it's because they think with all of their heart, just like you did, that they're doing the right thing for God. Um, so just be grateful for the parts that were real. Take what you can that's not toxic and find what feels right for you. Um, but yeah, it, it gets really, really dark, but know that you've made it this far and you can go, it gets brighter. That's all I can really say. I, I mean, it's scary, but it definitely gets brighter. Perfect. I think that's perfectly said. And you're a testament to the fact that it gets brighter just by how positive you are on camera about the whole experience, despite, like you say, incredible darkness in your story, you've triumphed. So I applaud that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story on my channel. Is there any way that people can um, find you online? Perhaps I, I can put some links below, but is there any anything that you kind of have in, have in mind for the future uh, ways that people can follow um, you i'm on instagram uh i think it's j underscore ray m or j ray underscore m i'll text it to you sure. um uh my i have a website janamontero.com all of the links are actually on there so if i said it wrong I'm just click the <laughs> link that's instagram <laughs> um that's where i feature my writing um i actually just submitted one of my teleplay, um, which is based on true events of my waking up process to a, a competition, a screenplay competition. So, um, so far placed in the top 29 percentile. So I, yeah, I have, I'm, you know, finally seeking fame in Satan's system. <laughs> Shameful. Yeah. Simple behavior. <laughs> how, how dare you pursue happiness um but no that's wonderful um yeah and i i've briefly looked at your screenplay and it's obvious to me that you're a very gifted writer so i foresee great things uh, Thank you. but once again uh huge admiration for what you're doing i hope your elders are watching because they <laughs> they were repeatedly expressing how sad it was to see you go but hopefully at some point in their lives, they'll be at a place where they can realize that you leaving is the best thing yes. and uh, the best decision you could have made. So uh, viewers, I hope you've enjoyed my conversation with Jana. Jana, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such conversations and videos. But for now, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Thank <laughs> you.